We have very unique opportunities of access to culture, of access to this wonderful network of people. So my goal today is to take that privilege and turn it into solidarity and to try to bring together this group of people who are here gathered to back up political causes that we should all be defending. It's not just the internet for the sake of the internet or technology for the sake of technology, because if these tools are not used to make the lives of people, this is a picture of a demonstration, demonstration in favor of internet access in Hungary last year. Often, I, I worry about the fact that we just fight for access for the sake of access, and we ignore other political fights that, are, that should be related to this. So I'd like to now refer to the 43 disappeared students in Mexico, and the 147 students who were killed in Garissa in Kenya, and the 6.5 million Syrian refugees. And I also would like to refer to... Snowden and Carmen Aristegui and many others who have fought for information access. And it's not just about having internet be accessible for everybody. No, it's about going one step beyond that and having information access in a whole new way. All of these cases, very sad cases, cannot be disconnected from the causes that we're fighting for. Our movement to defend free knowledge cannot be isolated from these realities, from these harsh realities that lead people to protest out in the streets. Why am I telling you this? I work with the creator of the web. And something that we always consider is respect for human rights. If there is no universal respect for human rights and every single right, not only political freedoms, but also social, cultural and economic rights, the web is nothing but a space for advertising, for buying and selling, for exchange. But it is not people-centered. And even if we have a very robust international human rights system, what we must ask ourselves is if that international framework that we have created through a lot of hard work and through horrible wars that have devastated humanity, we must ask ourselves if that is enough, if it satisfies all of our needs. I think that what we all feel after everything that the Snowden case revealed is that we have lost ground, that that democratic space that we all felt we had access to has become militarized, has become um, mercantilized, and it is now concentrated in but a few hands. We have lost our ability to change things in this world. So at this critical moment when we have lost ground in internet access, the proposals that we have with a group of thinkers and activists is to find a way to update, to give a new face to the international human rights framework, to introduce new rights. It is not about changing the rights that we already have, but about finding a way to explain to everybody that those rights must be interpreted in a new way in this new century. And some of these ideas might be provocative, controversial, they may lead to very heated discussions, but it's about adapting our framework to the realities that we're facing today. The first right is the right to access, to internet access. But what do I mean by internet access? The UNAP access, which allows me to look at one platform, or are we talking about and access to the total collective knowledge that we have all created that is out there. 
So what we try to defend is that every single policy to internet of internet access are about all internet for all people all the time. But also the right to net neutrality, that this and that this right be one that has no borders. We know that many governments want to create a, a, a national network, uh, a domestic one, such as Cuba, and, um, and it was justified with the embargo, they said. And what there's also the idea of a halal internet, which would only allow access to certain contents which are appropriate for certain religious groups, or how other countries would like to create or try to modify uh, geolocation the geolocation of content so that in some countries, in some contexts, they won't necessarily have access to all knowledge, everyone, depending on where they're located geographically. So the idea is that all of us can participate without um, there being any sort of importance placed on where we are geographically or our economic access. Another right is the right to collaborate and to participate online. I've seen how in many countries there's a huge obstacle. It's one a barrier that's even bigger than paying it. Uh, access to internet is being able to contribute to a platform in a significant way, and this does include. Uh, right to receive a different education, an education that would allow us to code, to access technologies and knowledge and techniques. And it, this would mean that our participation online would not just be passive reading, uh, consulting. And another right and one that's quite controversial for all of the Wikipedians here is the right to truth to, and the right to verify data and facts. And Tim Berners-Lee and others are always concerned about the constant propaganda that invades internet. And, and there is media manipulation. Uh, it happens offline and it's now um, passed over to online uh, spheres. There's a lot of lies. There's a lot of cycles of ignorance that get repeated on, on the web. And so the idea is how can we open up the debate to the right to truth and the right to verify data and facts. This is quite connected to uh, what also whistleblowers are doing, whistleblowers are doing, and the rights that we have as citizens and right to that sort of information that whistleblowers are sharing. Another right, and this is one that's quite crucial for us, is right to anonymity and to be free from massive surveillance. It's quite disappointing sometimes when you're trying to edit Wikipedia and as an author, this is the platform that, of course, I have a default platform to surf an internet, and I couldn't. And this is a concern that we can't develop our opinions in an anonymous way on, on the internet. And I think that this is a big concern for, for many in the community. The freedom to be able to push against massive surveillance, this has been one of the most visible movements in the last 24 months. But I'm concerned that it's the only demand that we might have, and it's the only aspect of surveillance that we'll be against. The, what's important about this right is that we can uh, not see that sometimes people understand massive surveillance as something that's limited to the state, but sometimes it's done with commercial purposes, with um, to be able to monetize behavior, and for many other things. To be able to modify behavior as well, to modify our consumption, that uh, and perhaps push consumption away from public interest, and we're realizing this less and less. It's it's hard to be aware of it. Another right that is one that is quite connected to the one I was just speaking about is the right to our own data and the right to own our own data. 
so here we're not just talking about the right of ownership of our data, but also to synchronize our data, to um, store our data, and the total and absolute control of our own data, and the collective, and the way that we could explore collectively different ways to um, synchronize and share our data, have data cooperatives. All of this would fit within this new way of looking at things. Also, this includes the right to access the data that's relevant for our decisions uh, and certainly is of um, public interest. And this is part of the open data framework. Another right is the right to dissent, the right to offend and to be offended and to understand that this is quite controversial. One of the problems that we have is that when we open ourselves to a shared, globally shared platform, one opts for prior censorship instead of openness as a, as a sort of standard in certain political contexts. And the problem that we're seeing in reality and what this brings about is that if we have more and more protections of people who are feeling offended, we're creating more and more barriers to the free flow of information. This is a proposal that's been debated extensively. And there are many different opposition groups who are organized opposition groups who will say, no, but the trolls, no, but the atheists. Oh, but my religion has been offended. Oh, this is affecting my identity. So there has to be a certain e equilibrium here. And what, what we prefer when we talk about open platforms and deliberating with debate with discussion, uh, not in you know c closed private rooms of governments who, who are um, trying to put a goal against, uh, it, getting a goal against the population. That's not the idea. Linked also to this is, is how we can organize ourselves online and the right to be anonymous. When, and, and this has to do with organization in Wikipedia, of course, but also it could be different collectives who are organizing to take a, a, a protest onto the streets or um, do boycotts on specific products. Others organize to uh, expose corruption. For example, what's happened with the hacking team and the news we've seen around that in the last few days. Now, another right is the, the right to hack. This, of course, is a very controversial right. And I think about all the things that we've been prohibited to do for 200 years ago, let's say. 200 years ago, women in their majority, in the vast majority of the world, couldn't vote. And, and this is what I'm talking about when I say we've, we've won and gained terrain. So the idea here is stop spying, stop censoring. Well, instead of saying that, we have to move towards spaces where we uh, earn those spaces, win those spaces as citizens, and we take them back, take control back over those. So to hack is a right that we should all have to be able to go in and explore code. This is connect also to being able to participate in a significant way in, in the culture, uh, online culture. If we can't analyze the, the code, if we don't know what it's made of, we can't analyze it. And so, you know, similarly, if we can't read and write, we can't uh, participate where it's a fundamental right. So the idea of exploring how the code is done, being able to go into the code and be able to understand and make transparent what is in public interest. But this also includes the right to know how, to understanding how things are done as well, and to knowledge. In the transition of the Internet of Things, we're going to be having a, another wave of people who have absolutely no clue. And because of laws of 
piece of secretness of uh, protecting companies and not people. Uh, and the secrecy laws also are looking at, cons will produce consumers who are completely ill-equipped. They're going to have this in their living room without understanding fully how it works. Or they could have a phone that is a microphone that gets activated remotely and they won't understand how it's working. They won't know that there's back doors installed on their devices. So this right to know how things are made is a fundamental right for the future. And also having the technical abilities to know how to work and how things work. This right is one of the most important rights for me personally, for everyone, but especially here in Latin America, the right to, to technology sovereignty, to be able to run our own communication systems, to be able to have our own platforms. We've seen how there's been a media concentration and media monopolies and monopolies in general controlled all of the debates in countries like this one, media monopolies here in this country also can put uh, a president into office and take him or her out. So the power to have our own systems, to communicate, our own telephone systems, our own being able to create our own software, our own hardware, to be able to communicate freely in the 21st century. And the right to store our own data. Of course, this is complicated and it will mean more resources and not all of us have the same level of progress that others do. We don't have to always be talking about the latest technology that's available. I can still recall that 15 years ago, we were able to communicate perfectly fine using our own servers and our, our own email systems. There wasn't Gmail, there wasn't YouTube, there wasn't Twitter, and we were able to do it. And it didn't seem like it was a big difference if they exist or not. And now we've become so dependent on technology that we ourselves cannot even control these are, we are the ones who are, are doing, making business for others and it's um, on our, on the back, on our backs, on, the, on our freedom and on our data. I wanna, now, the next thing that we'd like to see translated into a right is the right to free software. See this crystallize and and it, we'd like to see free software um, established and set as the standard because the policies of free software uh, should be the guarantees of any type of software. And this is something that, uh, that we should strive for. Another one is one of the biggest battles, but it's one that where many people are united. It's the right to create access it is to create our own knowledge, access uh, knowledge freely, and to be able to share our culture. Many people are fully aware that uh, copyright is a very protectionist aspect of our work, and we are looking for something that's completely opposite to this. We want to privilege open knowledge. We want to question why knowledge is so expensive and having access to it is so expensive, and uh, this addresses education. We understand also that uh, in copyrights and intellectual property also tries to criminalize when you try to have access to knowledge. This would require a radical change in our economy, and it would also require a change in the way we do politics and policies to be able to change it. So to, 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 to close this intro to the new rights we'd like to 
propose is that we need to look at all of these different rights that I commented on. We, we shouldn't look at them as isolated from problems, but see them as an interconnected way. Many times people in the media will talk about these rights as if they're for advanced societies or for people who have gotten beyond poverty and they've overcome it. And you know, it's for maybe the Europeans or the people from the United States. But these, in fact, are um, rights and problems that concern us in the South. And this is what we've been doing with all the other policies, is copying different models that do not put our people's interests in up front. If we don't see that, then we won't be able, we won't be able to not, not only will we not be able to take advantage, we won't even be uh, participating in them. We'll be consumers and, and uh, data hives and completely irrelevant, in fact, for what is being developed. So the list of issues that are mentioned here is just a proposal that's in development by a group of different people and it will incorporate many other conversations and we hope that you could all be part of this conversation soon and uh, let's have the floor open for any comments or critiques or and let's all participate in this. Thank you.